Hi, this is the third lecture of the Lower Extremity Anatomy in our board review series. A good book that you can use for study is this book written by myself. Foot and ankle approaches, the posterolateral approach that commonly comes in the exam. This um, uh, approach is used to, um, uh, for open reduction tendon fixation of a posterior malleolus. The interval is between the peroneae laterally and the flexor hallucis longus. Remember, the flexor hallucis longus is the um, uh, uh, interval on the medial side. So, peroneae laterally and the flexor hallucis longus uh, medially. Uh, remember, the flexor hallucis longus has a very uh, characteristic um, anatomy, uh, we usually call beef to heel, means that uh, the um, uh, muscular part goes all the way to the ankle. Uh, so this is the interval. Remember, it's flexor hallucis longus on the medial side, peroneae on the lateral side. Um, the structure at risk in this approach is the sural nerve. Uh, the sural nerve um, uh, is um, the structure at risk in this approach. Remember the, sh um, the relation of the saphenous vein and the sural nerve. The saphenous, the small saphenous, is medial to the uh, uh, nerve. So the uh, small um, the saphenous is medial uh, to the nerve. So if you see uh, uh, the vein and you'd like to protect the nerve, you, you retract the uh, vein laterally because that means that you are pushing uh, the vein and the nerve away from the field. So the relation of the sural uh, nerve to the saphenous, that the saphenous, the small saphenous is medial to the nerve. So it is medial to the nerve. So the vein is medial to the nerve. If you'd like to retract, you retract the vein laterally because in this case you're taking the vein and the nerve laterally and protecting uh, the nerve. So if they give you a scenario, for example, posterior malleus um, that needed RIF and then um, by postulator approach, um, a patient has a neuroma. What is the nerve? It's the sural nerve. Uh, we're going to talk about the anatomy of the sural nerve later, uh, but um, remember, sural nerve is the structure at risk for this approach. For the lateral approach for the fibula, that was the approach that we use to treat the lateral manulus. Uh, remember that the superficial peroneal nerve is the structure at risk. Uh, it comes um, into the superficial uh, fascia um, uh, about 12 centimeters from the uh, uh, tip of the distal fibula. So if you have an approach that um, will go about um, uh, 10 to 14 centimeter, an average 12 centimeter, uh, you may encounter that nerve. So the superficial peroneal nerve, um, it comes uh, into the superficial fascia anterior to the uh, mid uh, lateral plane of the fibula, about 12 centimeters from the tip of the distal uh, fibula. And this is the structure at risk for the lateral approach to the fibula. Anterior approach to the ankle, if you open anteriorly here, uh, the, uh, the uh, um, nerve at greatest risk is the medial dorsal cutaneous branch. This is one branch of the superficial peronea. Uh, so, um, for the anterior approach to the ankle in this area, uh, the nerve that is at greatest risk is the uh, dorsal medial branch of the superficial peroneal. So, the dorsal medial branch of the superficial peroneal is the structure at risk during anterior approach to the ankle. So, lateral approach to the fibula, it's the superficial peroneal, about 12 cm from the tip of the fibula. Anterior approach to the ankle, uh, the structure at risk is the um, medial dorsal um, a branch which is um, a, a, a branch of the superficial peroneal uh, nerve. Uh, so superficial peroneal nerve mm, for approaches of the fibula and tear exposure to the ankle um, is the uh, medial dorsal cutaneous branch which is um, a branch of the superficial peroneal. So in cases of Taylor fracture, doing double incision for open reduction internal fixation uh, will result in disruption of the blood supply to the talus, except uh, the deltoid branches of the artery of the tarsal canal. So these should be uh, uh, preserved in, uh, in order to avoid AVN of the talus. So if you do double incision for the uh, ORIF of the talus, the only remaining part is the deltoid branch, um, uh, which is, uh, comes from the artery of the tarsal canal. Um, uh, another um, uh, important point in the approaches is how to approach the subtalar from the medial uh, part. 
so medially the subtalar joint um, is approached in between the flexor uh, halluses and the flexor digitorum and this is called the master knot of henry so the master knot of henry is where the flexor um, uh, halluses and the flexor digitorum um, uh, across so remember the flexor digitorum comes from the lateral part of the lower leg uh, going to the um, medial side the flexor uh, halluses comes from the medial side of the lower leg going to the lateral side so uh, because they cross um, uh, uh, they will meet at the master knot of henry uh, and the flexor um, uh, digi uh, digitorum will be superficial to the flexor halluses so the flexor halluses will pass from lateral to medial uh, deep to the flexor um, uh, digitorum um, and uh, this is also we remember this uh, when we discussed the uh, posterolateral approach uh, we, w we said that uh, the approach is between the peroneae and the flexor halluses again because the flexor halluses comes from the lateral part of the lower leg and it goes to the medial side of the foot while the flexor digitorum comes from the medial side of the lower leg going to the lateral part of the foot so they, need, uh, they will have to cross and they cross at the master knot of Henry at the level of the subtalar joint the flexor halluses is deep to the flexor digitorum an important incision in the foot and ankle is the extensile lateral approach that's used for calcaneal fracture. Uh, it gives the best uh, exposure uh, to obtain anatomic reduction. However, it requires um, a raising a flap. Uh, the blood supply of the flap is mainly from the lateral calcaneal artery. So it's lateral calcaneal artery provides most of the blood supply for the raised flap in cases of the extensile lateral approach. Uh, this artery is about 1.5 cm anterior to the Achilles tendon, so the vertical incision of the extensile approach should be about 0.5 cm from the Achilles to avoid injury of the lateral calcaneal artery. The horizontal incision is at the junction of the lateral skin with the uh, plantar glabrous skin. Uh, and uh, this approach, as we said, gives the best exposure uh, for the calcaneus, but it requires elevation of the flap. Um, uh, the uh, flab main blood supply is from the lateral calcaneal artery. Now let's talk about ankle arthroscopy. The first portal uh, that is done is the anteromedial portal. Uh, the anteromedial portal, um, uh, uh, the structure that can injure, is the tibialis anterior to its lateral side and the saphenous uh, vein and nerve to its uh, um, uh, medial side. Um, this is the first portal to be established in ankle arthroscopy is the anteromedial um, uh, again it is medial to the tibialis anterior so it's more medial to the tibialis anterior muscle um, and uh, the tibialis anterior muscle can be injured with that uh, portal um, and uh, other structures at risk are the saphenous uh, vein and the saphenous nerve so uh, this approach is medial to the tibialis anterior muscle so it's medial to the tibialis anterior muscle this is the first portal uh, the anterolateral portal um, is uh, lateral to the peroneus tertius muscle um, so it's lateral to the peroneus tertius muscle and can injure the superficial peroneal nerve or um, the intermediate dorsal cutaneous uh, branch so the anterolateral it is just lateral to the peroneus tertius and can enter the superficial peroneal nerve uh, or uh, the intermediate dorsal cutaneous branch so uh, the posterolateral approach um, it's just lateral to the um, uh, uh, Achilles tendon and the structures at risk are the uh, sural nerve and the lesser saphenous uh, we said before that the lesser saphenous is medial to the sural uh, nerve uh, so the posterolateral structures at risk are the lesser saphenous sural nerve uh, it's just lateral to the Achilles tendon um, if this happens and you get injury to the sural nerve you will have a shooting pain uh, or numbness in the lateral border of the foot uh, you may get a scenario describing that and ask you what nerve is affected so it's the sural nerve um, and how do you treat that it's either release of the nerve if, if it's not severely injured or uh, excision and bury the end in the muscles or in the periosteum uh, sometimes the injury does not happen to the postural uh, to the sural nerve itself uh, it happens to the uh, lateral calcaneal nerve uh, which arises from the uh, sural nerve and supply the lateral heel pad 
Um, the uh, most commonly injured uh, um, uh, nerve during ankle arthroscopy is the intermediate dorsal cutaneous branch. Uh, so we said that in the um, slide before uh, that the anterolateral will injure either the superficial peroneal or uh, the uh, intermediate dorsal cutaneous branch. Um, uh, uh, all these uh, the, uh, nerves uh, injury are common. They commonly uh, come in the exam. Uh, if you remember when we talk about the anterior approach to the ankle, we said that the most commonly affected is the medial dorsal cutaneous nerve, which is a branch of the superficial peroneal. So the superficial peroneal gives the medial dorsal cutaneous. This is affected uh, with the anterior approach to the ankle. Uh, the intermediate dorsal cutaneous, this is affected uh, with uh, anterolateral portal in ankle arthroscopy. So as we said in the previous slide, the superficial peroneal artery, uh, when it comes, becomes superficial by exiting uh, from the crural fascia, it can be injured in the uh, approaches for distal fibula, or it can be injured in, during anterolateral ankle uh, portal uh, or in arthroscopy. So uh, you see here the superficial uh, peroneal uh, um, uh, nerve. Uh, when it uh, becomes a superficial exiting from the fascia, we said that happens about 12 centimeter from the tip uh, of the fibula. Can, it, this can be injured during approaches to the distal fibula or anterolateral ankle uh, arthroscopy portal. Also, another uh, nerve injury that you need to know is the uh, lateral plantar nerve. Lateral plantar nerve um, comes from the posterior tibial nerve uh, and it passes on the plantar surface of the foot uh, from uh, medial to lateral and it can be injured uh, during uh, the plantar approach for the TTC nail. So the plantar approach for the uh, uh, TTC nail, when you apply the, when you put TTC and do the plantar uh, incision, this can result in injury to the lateral plantar nerve. It goes from medial to lateral. So another important relation is the anterior tibial artery. Um, uh, the anterior tibial artery is medial to the deep fibular nerve or the um, anterior tibial nerve. So the deep fibular nerve is lateral and the anterior tibial artery is medial. In the lower leg here, the artery is medial to the extensor hallux longus, to the EHL, and then it passes um, uh, uh, from uh, medial to lateral, uh, deep to the muscle. So it passes um, uh, me uh, from medial to lateral, deep to the muscle, and to the extensor retinaculum, to the inferior, uh, uh, inferior extensor retinaculum, to become lateral. Uh, so um, at the level of the foot here, we have tibialis anterior, and then the uh, uh, extensor um, uh, uh, halluses each L and then uh, the artery and nerve and then the extensor digitorum. So um, anterior tibial artery is actually medial to the EHL in the lower leg and then it passes deep to the um, uh, extensor retinaculum and deep to the EHL to become on the lateral aspect of the muscle. And again, the nerve is medial, uh, the, the, the anterior tibial um, is medial and the deep peroneal nerve is lateral. So uh, the anterior tibial artery is medial, uh, the deep fibular nerve is lateral, uh, the uh, anterior tibial uh, artery is medial to the extensor halluses, and then at the level of the ankle, it passes from medial to lateral uh, under the muscle and under the uh, inferior extensor retinaculum. So at the level here of the uh, foot, it's tibialis anterior, it's uh, extensor halluses longus, and then the artery nerve, and then the extensor digitorum. In the intrinsic muscles of the foot, similar to the hand, the intrinsic muscle will flex the metatarsophalangeal joint and extend the interphalangeal joint. So intrinsic muscles of the foot, similar to muscles of the hand, causes flexion of the metatarsophalangeal joint and extension of the interphalangeal joint. So if you have weak extensors in the foot, you will have a claw foot, a, a claw toes. The clawing of the toes will result in extension of the metatarsophalangeal joint and flexion of the interphalangeal joints. So intrinsic muscles of the foot, what it does, it flexes the metatarsophalangeal joint and extend the interphalangeal joint. Uh, if you have weakness, you can develop clawing of the toes, uh, which will have reverse uh, of this function. So there will be extension of the metatarsophalangeal joint and flexion of the interphalangeal joint. Remember, there are nine compartments of the foot, nine compartments. Uh, there is no dorsal compartment of the foot. So the foot has nine compartments. None of them are dorsal. 
uh, these nine compartments, four of them are entered um, uh, OCI compartment. You have lateral compartment, medial compartment. You have two central, one superficial and one deep. The deep is sometimes called adductor. And you have the calcaneal um, compartment. So remember, there are nine compartments, four enter OCI, one lateral, one medial. This is six. And then you have two central, one superficial, and one deep. The deep sometimes called adductor, so we have eight now, and then one calcaneal. Remember, there is no dorsal compartment. So in the ligament of the syndesmosis between the uh, tibia and the fibula and the ankle, we have the interosseous ligament, of course, uh, connecting between the tibia and the fibula, and we have the anterior inferior and posterior inferior tibiofibular ligament. The anterior uh, tibiofibular ligament uh, is uh, larger than the posterior tibiofibular ligament. Uh, in case of avulsion of the anterior tibiofibular ligament, it pulls the anterolateral uh, uh, part of the tibia, and this is called the telofracture, as you can see here in the X-ray. So this is the anterolateral part of the tibia. This is anterior, this is posterior, lateral, medial. Here is an avulsion of the anterior inferior tibiofibular uh, ligament, and it will result in telofracture. Now we're going to speak about the flexor hallucis muscle, the FHL. Uh, this muscle has a very specific anatomy. It frequently comes in the exam. Uh, uh, so the muscle, uh, the flexor hallucis uh, longus, um, it runs lateral to the posteromedial tubercle of the talus. So the talus here, this is the posteromedial tubercle. Uh, in the next slide, I'm going to show you um, uh, another picture that will show that um, more clear. Uh, so it runs lateral to the posteromedial tendon of the talus, and then uh, it turns around the cystentaculum tali. So here is the cystentaculum tali from the medial side. The tendon will be under the cystentaculum tali. So if you're doing calcaneous fracture and putting the screw, and the screw went uh, uh, inferior to the uh, uh, cystentaculum tali, and it was long, it will irritate the flexor hallucis longus. This uh, sometimes comes uh, in the exam. Uh, they will give you a picture of uh, like uh, uh, ag axial view of the calcaneus, show a long screw um, distal to the cystentaculum to lie and ask you which muscle is affected is the FHL. And then there is a very uh, important relation after that, which is this part here uh, and this part here. It's called the master node of Henry. So what is the knot of Henry? What's going on is the flexor hallucis uh, longus. Uh, it originates from the lateral pa part of the lower leg, and it's going to the most medial structure, which is the big toe. Uh, the flexor digitorum longus, uh, the uh, muscle, it arises actually from the medial side of the uh, lower leg, and it goes to more lateral structure. So in order for this to happen, they have to cross each other. So they cross each other here in a way that the flexor hallucis longus tendon, the FHL, is deep to the flexor digitorum longus. You can see here again, here is the uh, flexor uh, digitorum longus. Uh, the uh, flexor digitorum longus is here, and the flexor hallucis longus is here, and they cross each other here, and the crossing is in the way that the um, FHL, the flexor hallucis longus, is deep to the flexor digitorum longus. Uh, this um, uh, relation frequently comes in the exam. So the note of Henry... Uh, it is the crossing of the FHL with the flexor digitorum longus, uh, and uh, the FHL will be deep to the flexor hallucis longus. Um, this uh, slide here shows two pictures to uh, show the anatomy of the flexor hallucis uh, more clear. Here is, if you're seeing it from above, uh, this is the lateral process. Um, of the talus. This is the posterior prolosis. It has um, a posterolateral tubercle and posteromedial tubercle. Uh, the FHL passes lateral to the posteromedial tubercle. So here it's lateral to the posteromedial tubercle. So it's posterior to the talus and then it turns around the talus here in the groove that you can see here um, uh, in the talus um, uh, and then it becomes uh, inferior to the cystitaculum tali. So now we're going to talk about the peroneal muscle. This uh, relation commonly asked, comes in the exam. We have the peroneus brevis and peroneus longus um, in the peroneal groove behind the fibula. Peroneus brevis is uh, deeper, means it's closer to the bone or more anterior and more medial than the peroneus longus. Remember, brevis starts with B, so it's closer to the bone, which starts with B. So brevis here, it's uh, uh, deep in the peroneal groove. It's anterior and medial than the uh, peroneus 
uh, longest. Uh, both peroneal muscles will travel deep to the uh, uh, peroneal uh, 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 retinaculum, and they will be separated by the uh, peroneal uh, tubercle. Uh, the peroneal tubercle will uh, separate the peroneal bravus and uh, peroneus uh, longus. The peroneal bravus will be uh, more anterior to it. Uh, sometimes they refer to this relation to more dorsal. Um, uh, or more superior um, uh, uh, for the uh, Bironius uh, longus uh, will be uh, more uh, caudal, more plantar, more inferior uh, or underneath that uh, tubercle. So the tubercle is in the lateral part of the calcaneus, separate between the Bironius uh, um, uh, bravus, which is going to be anterior um, uh, uh, or you can say superior or dorsal, and the Bironius uh, longus, which is going to be inferior or you can uh, 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 describe it as a uh, caudal uh, or uh, posterior or just underneath that uh, enlarged tubercle. Both peroneus longus and peroneus brevis uh, eversed the subtalar joint. However, the peroneus longus, because it passes um, a, a plantar to the tarsal bone and attaches to the first ray, also does plantar flexion of the first ray. Uh, which is a factor in um, maintaining the foot arch. So uh, peroneus longus and peroneus brevis both are on the lateral aspect of the subtalar and uh, both causes eversion of the subtalar. Peroneus longus uh, passes a plantar and attach it to the first ray, so it causes uh, plantar flexion of the first ray and this create um, or factor in creating the foot arch. Uh, there is a third peroneal muscle called peroneus tertius. Most anatomy books will refer to it as fibularis tertius. Um, this is a, a, a small muscle. Um, uh, uh, you can see it here. Um, so this is the uh, fibularis uh, tertius muscle. It attaches to the uh, uh, fifth um, uh, metatarsal and it also uh, evert. Um, however, um, it also does dorsiflexion. So peroneus tertius or um, the fibularis tertius muscle, um, it, it dorsiflexes. It's on, on the anterior aspect of the ankle and it does some eversion of the subtalar joint because it attaches here to the lateral aspect of the foot. So there's uh, two muscles that are antagonist uh, to each other, uh, two groups of muscle. Posterior tibial muscle and peroneus brevis are antagonist. Uh, posterior tibial muscle um, uh, invert uh, the subtalar. Uh, peroneus uh, brevis inverse the subtalar. They are antagonist. Anterior tibial muscle, uh, it inverse uh, the subtalar uh, and also dorsiflex the first ray. Um, uh, peroneus longus muscle uh, evers the subtalar and plantar flex the first ray, so they are antagonists. So remember, posterior tibial muscle and peroneus brevis are antagonists. Anterior tibial muscle and peroneus longus uh, are antagonists. Uh, uh, this sometimes comes in the pathology of cavus uh, foot. Uh, so uh, you need to know this uh, relation because it comes into the cavus foot and we mentioned that uh, into uh, the uh, pediatric uh, lecture of cavus foot. So remember, peroneus bravus and posterior tibial muscles are antagonists, peroneus longus and anterior tibial muscles are antagonists. Two ligaments frequently come in the exam, the spring ligament and the um, Liss Frank ligament. This is an X-rays of two patients. Um, who has Liss Frank injury? You can see the widening here and the widening here. So, what is the Liss Frank ligament, um, which is affected in the Liss Frank injury? It, the ligament runs between the medial cuneiform and the second metatarsal. So, remember, it's between the medial cuneiform, medial cuneiform, and the second metatarsal, base of the second metatarsal. Uh, and now the spring ligament. Um, the spring ligament is very important in the uh, pathology of the posterior tibial tendon dysfunction and the adult acquired flat foot. Um, so the other name of the spring ligament is the calcaneolavicular. Um, so it goes from the calcaneus to the navicular. This uh, picture here is seeing the uh, bones of the foot from the plantar surface. Uh, um, uh, that. Uh, uh, a, a calcaneo navicular ligament or the spring ligament, it supports the talo navicular articulation. So it supports uh, the tailor head, it prevents the tailor head from collapsing and falling uh, plantar ward. So it supports the talo navicular um, articulation. Uh, it prevents the collapse of the arch. So again, the mm, spring ligament or the um, uh, calcaneo navicular ligament uh, is uh, important in the pathology and the pathogenesis of the adult acquired flat foot. It goes from the calcaneus to the navicular. It supports the tailor head, 
that support that telonavicular articulation. Um, when this ligament uh, becomes uh, um, uh, inefficient and becomes ruptured, um, the uh, tailor head will fall. Um, uh, and uh, you can see in the uh, telonavicular articulation uh, there is collapse, um, and resulting in collapse of the arch. So uh, that uh, calcaneonavicular ligament is actually um, uh, 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 co consists of the uh, uh, two parts, the supromedial calcaneonavicular and the inferior calcaneonavicular. Uh, more recent studies uh, talks about two uh, that the um, uh, inferior calcaneonavicular is actually two ba bands, medial uh, uh, and the plantar. Um, uh, but in general, you have the uh, bigger one, uh, which is the supromedial calcaneonavicular. Um, um, this is the supromedial calcaneonavicular ligament um, and the uh, inferior calcaneonavicular. And again, a more recent studies talks about uh, two bands of that inferior calcaneonavicular, uh, medial one and uh, plantar, uh, uh, inferior plantar. Uh, so uh, these two ligaments commonly come in the exam, this frank. Remember, medial cuneiform and base of the second metatarsal. Uh, spring ligament is the calcaneonavicular between the calcaneus and the navicular bone. Um, two parts, the supromedial part and the uh, inferior calcaneonavicular. The two main lateral uh, uh, ankle ligaments are the anterior talofibular, talo because it comes from the talus, so it's not tibio because the anterior tibiofibular is one of the syndesmotic but this is the talofibular ligament and the calcaneofibular ligament. So the calcaneofibular ligament is um, uh, under maximum stress with inversion and the dorsiflexion. So when you dorsiflex, the calcaneofibular ligament will be um, under tension with inversion. Um, the anterior talofibular ligament, this is the ligament most commonly injured uh, with the uh, inversion injury. This is under stress with inversion and plantar flexion. So when you plantar flex uh, uh, the ankle and you invert the anterior talofibular mm, uh, ligament uh, becomes under uh, maximum tension. So remember anterior talofibular ligament and calcaneofibular ligament both under stress with inversion, but the anterior talofibular is with inversion and plantar flexion. Calcaneofibular ligament is with inversion and dorsiflexion. Another important topic is the hallux schizomoids. We have two hallux schizomoids, medial and lateral, which we sometimes call them the medial is tibial, the lateral is fibular. These uh, fall into the respective head of the flexor hallux brevis. Uh, the flexor hallux brevis inserts into the proximal phalanx. Um, in between the two heads will be the long, uh, the tendon of the, fl uh, uh, of the, um, the flexor hallux longus, which insert into the distal fragment. Um, uh, if you excise um, any of uh, the uh, uh, sesamoid, that will result into weakness uh, of that um, uh, flexor uh, brevis tendon and can result into a deformity. Uh, so if you excise uh, the medial sesamoid, this will uh, weaken this so the uh, lateral will be stronger and this patient will go into a hallux vulgus. If you remove the lateral one or the fibular one, you will have more pull from the uh, medial side and the patient may go into hallux varus. Uh, so uh, if you uh, do a sesamoidectomy for any reason, uh, you should repair uh, the tendons. You should not just uh, remove the uh, piece of bone because this will weaken uh, that head of the flexor brevis. You should um, uh, repair the tendon of the flexor uh, brevis to avoid this complication. You can get lots of scenarios regarding this. Um, so um, uh, uh, you may be asked, for example, um, uh, uh, um, what structures you have to repair if you excise the medial sesamoid? It will be the medial head of the uh, flexor hallucis brevis. Um, they may give you another example: 50 patient, a 50-year-old female um, uh, had medial sesamoidectomy for sesamoid pain. Uh, what can develop, you remove this, this will be pulling harder, so she will develop hallux vulgus. Um, if you remove both sesamoids, um, uh, um, you may uh, end into uh, cock up uh, deformity. Um, also, uh, the, um, uh, the two uh, sesamoids are connected together with intersesamoid ligament and the plantar plate. The plantar plate inserts into the base of the proximal phalanx. So uh, the plantar plate is inserted into the base of the proximal phalanx and it's connected to the two sesamoid uh, bone. 
uh, the tibial sesamoid, the medial one is bipartite in about 10% of the individual uh, and 25% of these are bilateral. So if you get an X-ray of the other side, you'll also, there's 25% percent, uh, 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 chance that the other one will also be bipartite. So this is a hallux is a moid, um, important to understand where it lies. It lies into the head of the flexor um, hallux brevis. Uh, in between the two heads, the flexor hallux longus will go and insert into the distal fragment. Um, if you excise the medial one, the lateral one will be pulling harder. The patient may develop hallux valgus. If you, do, if you excise the lateral, the patient may develop hallux varus. If you um, excise both, uh, you may get a cock up deformity. Uh, that uh, the plantar um, uh, plate is attached to the base of the proximal phalanx and the two sesamoids, and also there is the intersesamoid ligament. As we have discussed before, the flexor hallucis longus tendon passes in between the two sesamoids, which are actually in the two heads of the flexor um, hallucis brevis. The flexor hallucis brevis inserts into the proximal phalanx, the flexor hallucis longus inserts into the distal uh, phalanx. Uh, the conjoint tendon, which is uh, the lateral part, um, the lateral part, uh, head of the flexor hallucis brevis, together with the two heads of the adductor halluses, um, will insert into the lateral sesamoid and to the lateral part of the base uh, of the proximal um, phalanx. And uh, this is important for the uh, soft tissue release uh, during the uh, bunion surgery. So, very important topic in the anatomy of the foot is the blood supply of the talus. It can be affected with fractures or surgical incisions. So, we need to uh, know this uh, very good because it commonly comes in the exam. There is three main sources: uh, the artery of the tarsal canal, and the artery of the sinus tarsi, and the, del uh, the deltoid uh, branch. So, the posterior tibial artery will give two of these: the deltoid artery and the uh, uh, tarsal canal artery. So, both of these will come from the posterior tibial artery. And the uh, sinus tarsi artery or the tarsal sinus artery will come from anastomosis between the anterior tibial artery and the perforating peroneal artery. So anterior part um, here anteriorly will be the anterior tibial and the peroneal. perforating peroneal will come into anastomosis, give it the sinus tarsi. And this sinus tarsi artery will actually supply most of the anterior talus, the neck and the body is supplied by the sinus tarsi artery, which actually comes from anterior tibial and perforating peroneal. Posterior tibial artery will give the blood supply to the posterior talus, which is the body. Uh, uh, the most important one is the tarsal canal, gives the lateral two-third. The deltoid branch gives the medial one-third. The importance of the deltoid branch it, it, is that sometimes uh, this is the only remaining branch with displaced fracture. So the deltoid um, the branch and the uh, tarsal canal both comes from the posterior um, the tibial. They give the body, which is posterior talus. Tarsal uh, canal gives the uh, lateral two-third and the deltoid gives a uh, medial one-third. Uh, the anterior tibial with the perforating, they come into anastomosis, giving the uh, tarsal sinus uh, artery or the sinus tarsi artery, which gives the anterior tears. This is another uh, uh, good um, depiction here in the AO website. Uh, so this is as if you're looking from the uh, back. Here is the body, here is the neck, here is the head. Uh, the uh, sinus um, uh, 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 tarsal canal artery supply most of the body. Uh, the deltoid will give the medial uh, part. Um, uh, the, and the perforating uh, peroneal with the anterior tibial will give the sinus tarsal artery, which supplies the anterior um, the talus, uh, which is the head and the neck. Uh, this is the picture if you're looking at talus from uh, uh, inferiorly. Uh, the medial side is the tarsal canal, lateral part is the sinus. Uh, 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 tarsi, which has the sinus uh, tarsi artery. Uh, um, and uh, this is uh, here. Uh, if you're looking from the uh, medial side, you have the posterior tibial artery, which will give this, uh, the deltoid branch, supplying the medial part of the uh, body, and the uh, tarsal canal, which supplies most of the body. Um, uh, the anterior tibial and the perforating peroneal uh, will give the anastomosis and give the uh, sinus uh, uh, tarsi, which will give the anterior uh, talus, which is uh, the uh, neck and the uh, uh, head of the talus. Thank you, and I hope this lecture will be useful for you uh, in your final orthopedic exam and also in your practice of orthopedics.